For the last decade, much of the transatlantic discourse has been driven by the question of what European partners can do to support U.S. strategies in key regions and on critical issues. But what does Europe want from the United States? What are the key items on the European agenda in which U.S. cooperation will be critical? Who should drive European strategy toward the United States? Who will drive it? Well, thank you for all for joining us this early on a Sunday morning. Uh, I spent all night and into the early morning Saturday with Eurozone uh, finance ministers uh, discussing a bailout for Cyprus. So I missed most of your panels yesterday because I was sleeping. Um, but I appreciate everyone getting up with us today. Um, the title of this panel, I think, is quite interesting for a couple of reasons. What does Europe want from the U.S.? Uh, as Ian pointed out to me when we were heading in here, it's usually the other way around. Everyone wants to know what the U.S. wants for Europe. It's nice to turn it on its head a little bit to look at it the other way. Um, but to me, the other issue, which I'd like to explore, and hopefully we can get to the panelists to deal with, is it's a bit of a difficult question because of this definition of Europe. Is there a what Europe wants? And, uh, you know, I think from uh, the summit that we just had here last week, case in point, the Prime Minister of, of Great Britain, the President of France, pushing for lifting of the arms embargo on Syria so we can arm the rebels, and the reaction from the rest of Europe was not hugely enthusiastic. From a German wait and see, to outright hostility from, frankly, some of the most transatlantic members of NATO, including uh, the country where this current Secretary General comes from, Denmark. Uh, issues like Russia have also always bedeviled Europe on this, this front. Uh, we have countries uh, from the Central and Eastern Europe who are very concerned about energy security, uh, issues like Georgia, where we saw uh, the Russians being quite aggressive in the region, and then we have countries like France, which decided to sell uh, amphibious ships to the Russians, Germany setting up its own pipeline to Gazprom. Is there a common policy that can be developed uh, in Europe and how does, that, how does that affect relations and a view towards the United States? I also just want to point out before I go to the panel that it happens in a context. Uh, one of the contexts obviously is what, what Charles has written about, the rise of the rest. Uh, you know, obviously last, yesterday we had the panel on the US-EU trade agreement. That is an agreement that clearly is coming from some of the geopolitical imperatives of shouldn't the US and the EU come together because they have common interests in a world where the BRICS, where China and others have different interests forcing together. On the other hand, there are centrifugal forces at play here. Uh, obviously, the generational shift in the US in particular that Secretary Gates mentioned in his sort of salutary uh, speech given just across town here, talking about a new generation of leaders in the United States who didn't fight the Cold War with the Europeans, less emotionally tied to that transatlantic um, uh, relationship, but most importantly also the Obama pivot and what does that mean? I mean obviously the administration has talked quite a bit that just because we're pivoting to Asia doesn't mean we're not paying attention to Europe, but as anyone in this room who has been in a policy position before knows leaders can only focus at one thing at a time, maybe two. It's very difficult if you're pivoting one way to keep your eye on the other side. With that, um, let me turn to the panel and we'll, we'll address people uh, left to right. We'll start with uh, Artis Pabriks, who's the defense minister from uh, Latvia. Again, on this issue of, of, of Russia, I'll be pinging you on this one. Uh, sitting next to him is Ambassador Pierre Vimont, who is uh, the director, uh, Secretary General of the European External Action Service, the awkwardly named uh, diplomatic corps for the EU. And uh, the ambassador and I go back quite a bit when he was ambassador in Washington and I was covering foreign policy for the Wall Street Journal uh, in Washington. Uh, sitting next to him is Franco Fertini, also another person who is not unknown to us here in Brussels, former Italian commissioner to the, to the European Commission, but more recently the Italian uh, foreign minister, uh, particularly uh, during the, the Libya conflict, who obviously can talk to us a bit about how uh, the U.S. played a role leading from behind in that conflict. And finally, as I, I mentioned before, Charles Kupchin, senior fellow at the Council of Foreign Relations, has written quite a bit about this issue of the rise of the rest and how that affects uh, the rest of the West. So what I'm going to do is just sort of ask the panelists for very brief, I've been told that I have to be a disciplinarian here and, and keep everyone to about three or four minutes. Mr. Minister, uh, can you, if you can start talking a bit about how you view not only Europe's view, but particularly from your, your region, what Europe wants from, from the U.S. Sir. Thank you. Well, I caught myself that on this Sunday morning I'm trying to figure out how to stay politically correct and still, <laughs> still, still <laughs> say what, what we think. And uh, I would try to compare the U.S.-European uh, relationship as a, let's say, 
long-standing partnership, either within marriage or not. And then in the last years, we heard that uh, appeared some kind of a nice counterpart on the other side of the globe, and our partner is very much tended to have this new relationship developed. And I think that the European um, interest is simply to remind from time to time uh, to this uh, old husband, let's say, that we are also still here and you should tender us as well. So I think that's in the brief what we are interested to, um, to um, uh, receive from the United States as vis-a-vis uh, -vis Europe. But then, of course, um, mm, the more serious question is, uh, if we are trying to uh, distinguish what are the European interests uh, regarding the United States, then we first have to clearly define uh, who represents the European interests and how we can really f find how Europe sees itself. So basically, what do we want from ourselves? And uh, lately, um, I think that European Union actually do not have a very clear message what to give abroad, uh, because uh, we have a fatigue of enlargement, we have a fatigue of uh, deepening our union, and uh, even if we have been receiving as a European Union the Nobel Prize, I think actually the, the good a uh, good outcome of this uh, Nobel Prize issue would be to say that, listen, as, a, as an old dancing partners, we should share this with the United States. Because I don't think that European Union would receive this Nobel Prize or would um, fit qualify for this Nobel Prize without the assistance of the United States. So I actually um, see uh, this a new dialogue of the second um, United States government about uh, a free trade agreement is highly important. Because do we like it or, or not? This is a question uh, of our uh, stance within the global world. And this is not anymore so much about the peace between France and Germany or something in, in, in Western Europe. It's about the European or liberal democratic system within the global perspective. If we fail to make this agreement and if we fail to figure out the next following steps, then probably uh, uh, Europe will be the biggest loser. And uh, maybe the there's a lot of issues I would like to tackle up during our discussion. And, and the final thing what I wanted to mention as a defense minister, I think we should remember that, um, among others, uh, Europe is not only in the, some kind of economic disarray, at least some regions of Europe, but uh, we are also the region which uh, have been granted for free security for the last 50, 60 years. This is why we could expand economically, we could speak about our soft power. At this moment, I think we reach the critical phase in our mentality, in our psychology, and also in real politics, where we uh, assume that our security is uh, something granted for free for us, to us, that we should not invest this, and uh, the post-Second World generations, in my view, particularly in the Western Europe, they assume that war or unsecure environment is something which doesn't exist in Europe anymore. And I would like to say that this is a very, very grave mistake in European minds. Military, defense, security issues are inherent part of uh, common social, cultural, economic life of every country, of every continent. And as some observers say, there are no long-standing situations in the world where on the one hand you have a rich, prosperous, but demilitarized region next to the less rich and, uh, let's say, aggressive or military developing regions. This disbalance doesn't remain for a long time. So please, Europeans, my dear friends, keep it into mind. And I have to tell this because Europe, as European Union, ends 200 kilometers from our capital. Two points which I'll want to get back on. One, I do like this theme of reminding the old husband uh, to pay attention, because as I do my travels, particularly in Central and Eastern Europe, <clears throat> the issue of Article 5 and whether it still holds sway in the United States. The Americans realize that this is a common security uh, uh, clause that, is, that needs to be abided by is, is repeated to me uh, by the, member, the new member states in, in Central and Eastern Europe. But also this issue clearly of lack of defense investment on this side of the ocean, something the American, the Pentagon in particular, and the State Department both hammer on quite a bit. I think they're both issues that we'll have to get back to uh, quite a bit. Ambassador um, Vimont, if I could turn to you, um, obviously you're in the, in the belly of the beast in terms of the ability of Europe together to form a common policy on everything external, but particularly the US. Um, maybe if you could touch on that theme or, or anything else you want to in, in, your, in your introductory remarks. Ambassador Vimont. Thank you, thank you very much, and I'll be very brief because on a Sunday morning I think I need a little bit of warm up <laughs> to, 
to um, uh, 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 a few remarks very quickly. F first of all, um, the debate about um, what we want from from Europe, mostly go what we want from the United States, mostly goes around the same two or three ideas. Um, the, um, the Europeans complain that the uh, U.S. leadership uh, today seems to be missing and the Americans uh, strike back saying that the Europeans should be a little bit more um, uh, ambitious, um, uh, a little bit more forthcoming and should try to bring their own contribution, whether it be defense, whether it be the Middle East peace process and that goes back time and again. And I would say the second big idea is uh, the Europeans have this impression that uh, the American administration, because of the uh, pivoting towards Asia, is not paying as much attention to the Europeans and to the European Union as it used to do a, a few years ago. It, it seems to me, first of all, that all this is, um, is somewhat a bit short uh, in terms of analysis. And, and first of all, because there is a rather extraordinary contradiction since the beginning. Very rarely have we seen in Washington a US president who was in intellectually so close to the Europeans. Um, one of your colleagues while I was in Washington was telling me time and again, no, no, no surprise that the Europeans love Obama. You know, he's got 80%, 90% in all the opinion polls here in, in Europe. It's because he thinks like a European, you know, he, this is a president president who's talking about the multipolar world, etc., and seems to have all the same analysis as, as we do. And therefore, it's quite surprising when you have a, an American president like that, that to have the um, uh, Europeans at the same time feeling that he's getting away and drifting away from Europe. There's a little bit of contradiction there, in my opinion. And I wonder whether, and that will be my, my second observation, whether, in fact, what we're facing today is not at all this sort of drifting apart, but rather both together, uh, the Europeans, just like the Americans, facing a more and more sophisticated and complex world with many actors, global challenges happening every day, crisis popping up every day, a very complex world that we don't know how to deal with and that either on the uh, American side or the or European side, we haven't got the right answers so far because maybe we're not uh, strong enough in the way we assess the situation and understanding exactly what's happening and maybe uh, not speaking enough to each other to try together to find the, uh, the right solutions. Uh, we're moving on, we're rather pragmatic. Uh, we will certainly discuss about Libya, maybe about Mali and other things. There is a division of labor that is slowly emerging there between America and, and Europe. Um, but maybe we haven't been able, first of all, to theorize it yet. And secondly, um, we're still somewhat uncertain about where we're heading to. And I think this is the real problem I think we're facing at the moment. I'll stop here. It's a difficult one for, for journalists in particular because we don't like complexity. We like to be oversimplified in, in, in an indifferentiated world in which the relationship between the US and the EU differs on different issues. Uh, very hard for our, to hold our attention on this. But I, this issue of, of you know, the, 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 the complaining uh, back and forth that the US doesn't pay enough attention to Europe, uh, that the Americans believe the Europeans should lead, there was no better uh, example of that, I think, than, than the Libya situation, where you did have that dynamic play itself out. The Obama administration very much willing to allow Europe to lead on that. And obviously, Minister Fatini, you were part of that as, as, as the Italian uh, finance for, foreign minister. I also might mention uh, the great mentioner in the sky has also mentioned uh, Mr. Fatini's name as potentially a successor to Anders Fogh Rasmussen in NATO, so it's something that you may be dealing with in the future. Can you talk a bit about that dynamic, that transatlantic dynamic, and whether that, that burden sharing that the ambassador talked about uh, is a good thing potentially for the transatlantic relationship, or is it a sign that, of divergence? Well, um, I think what are our goals, what to do, and how? These are my three brief points. Uh, since our goals are to implement and to follow uh, this uh, strategic cooperation on the basis of common values, democracy, rule of law, individual liberty, I consider that, first of all, a stronger Europe is in the interest of the United States. I used to say we need more Europe, not less America. This is my departing point. Since I'm convinced of that, 
I think that a division of labor, of cooperation where sometimes Europe is in the condition to take the lead, as it was in the Balkans, as it should be in Mediterranean area, as it should be in North African country, shouldn't lead to a decoupling of transatlantic security. Transatlantic security is a good, is something that we have to keep together. In some cases, Euro should be in the lead. I can mention the case of Libya. Maybe I'll be further elaborating later during this debate. I would mention the uh, idea that has emerged of having a strong involvement not only of our partners, our member of NATO in the NATO mission, Unified Protector, but involving partners. In the first case of Libya, four <clears throat> Arab states that are partners of NATO participated in terms of capabilities, not only political support, which was decisive for the go-ahead, but they, they participated in terms of capability. In that case, America, somebody says, led from behind. I saw that situation. I think this was a good example where some Europeans, uh, I wouldn't say first of all, but uh, among the first Italy, knowing better than others the situation in Libya, was playing a good role uh, by, I would say, cooperating, exchanging information, and so on and so forth, while the United States have been cooperating. The same applies, and should apply, to the near future in that area, because uh, it is not enough to say the mission in Libya led to liberating uh, Libya, Libyans from the regime. Now, we have to stabilize. The Libyan situation is very fragile. The situation in Sahel and North Africa is becoming more and more fragile. Think about Tunisia. We, we have been hoping about a consolidation of regime in Tunisia, and unfortunately, they had to change the government a few days ago. So now, more than ever, American involvement in North Africa is what we need. Even though, I would repeat, Europe should take the lead. On the contrary, think about the Gulf. Should, uh, think about the uh, negotiations to bring Iran to be, I would say, a responsible partner and not undermining the security. In this case, I would like very much America taking the lead. A we cooperating in the Gulf, for example, where we want to be part and unfortunately accept some of important NATO initiatives there, Europeans as European countries are not so much involved as it should be. The same applies to Middle East. I agree with what Pierre Vimont said. I, I never seen a president of the United States so close to the uh, European perspective of working together. A final point, we want to, uh, to have from America is also the concrete and smooth implementation of what I would call the second pillar, that is economic cooperation. The offer to negotiate a free trade agreement between the United States and Europe is something that can very easily complement the security perspective. And then I wouldn't repeat what uh, the minister just said about the importance of avoiding this exercise of horizontal cuttings in defense and security spending. Instead, we should think about coordinating, optimizing, taking political decision, not a bureaucratic decision that, well, we have to reduce by 1.3% and that's all by horizontal acts. Thank you very much. I think we will not get a more clear clarion call for transatlantic cooperation in, in, in various regions. But just to tie a couple of the comments together, again, getting back to Libya, um, when we asked what Europe wants from the U.S., again, to get back to the, the minister's point about investment, clearly, even if Europe wanted to go alone, 
in Libya, it couldn't. It needed to rely on U.S. command and control, uh, and, and through the NATO uh, integrated command structure, was, was forced to do that. There was no institution, no technical, frankly, capability to do it on its own. So thank you for that, Mr. Minister. The, the academic in the room gets to wrap everything up. I'll turn to you, Mr. Kupchin. I, you may want to address this issue of, of whether the U.S. and the U.S. are actually being forced together uh, in, a, in a new sort of post-Cold War world or, or uh, take us in a different direction. But I want to hand it to you to, to wrap up the panel. And then just a warning, um, I will turn it over to the audience uh, right after that. And, and those of you who I recognize in the audience, if I get no hands, I'm going to call on you anyway. So uh, Dr. Kupchin, can I, can I ask you to, to wrap Thanks, us up Peter. here? Yeah, just uh, three <laughs> reflections in part based upon what my colleagues have just said. The first would be that I think that there is a, uh, a comforting natural resilience to the partnership that has shown through over the last few decades. Uh, if we had been sitting on this podium in 1992, 1993, I think many of us would have been skeptical that NATO would exist in 2013. Not to mention that NATO would have just completed a 10-year mission in Afghanistan, just uh, toppled Gaddafi in Libya. Uh, and I take a certain kind of comfort in the fact that George Bush comes into office dismissive of Europe and leaves an Atlanticist. That uh, Barack Obama in his first term as he starts off uh, says, I'm going to sort of not dismiss Europe, but go off and build new partnerships with China and Turkey and Brazil and India. And guess what? That's darn hard to do. And in the middle of his first term, he declares himself an Atlanticist. Uh, and so I, you know, I think we should recognize how much stickiness there is to the relationship. Uh, second point, uh, I think we're, we're in a period of what I would call the tyranny of domestic politics. That is, so much of what Americans want from Europe and what Europeans want from the United States is hostage to internal political forces. So uh, in terms of what's happening here, uh, you know, the United States wants things, many of which are really uh, not part of America's foreign policy. It's up to you guys. It's about fiscal union. It's about banking union. It's about whether David Cameron can manage the UK Independence Party and keep his country in the European Union. Uh, and these are, are, are issues over which the United States has very little purchase. And I think the same thing is true going back on the other side of the Atlantic. A lot of what you guys want from us depends upon our ability to get our act together internally. Uh, and I would identify two or three things that are particularly important. One is, will Obama be able to manage the strategic retrenchment that we are experiencing in a judicious manner? Right? We know the United States is turning inward. We know that the defense budget is getting whacked. We know Obama wants to decrease America's strategic exposure in the Middle East. Will he do that in a measured way, or will it be a bit of an erratic mess? We don't know the answer to that question. A lot of it depends on the ability of Obama to manage uh, bipartisan cooperation within the United States. The same is true on the economic front. Will we get a budget deal? Will we be able to renew uh, the, the domestic foundations of our foreign policy by getting our economic house in order? We don't know the answer to that question, but that in many respects is much more important to you guys than uh, the latest issue of, of NATO burden sharing. Uh, and then on the, some of the issues that you care about, like Guantanamo, climate change, things that you had hoped for, uh, there I'm a little bit skeptical. Uh, I don't see the uh, Obama administration having a huge amount of momentum when it comes to these issues. Perhaps on climate change, we'll see some progress because of the shale gas revolution. Uh, power stations going from coal to gas, new technologies, but I wouldn't hold my breath on cap and trade or something more ambitious. Final point. And in some ways, it, it is uh, the, the flip side of this, the tyranny of domestic politics. This is a moment in history in which we collectively need to be outwardly focused. We've been living through a 200-year period of history in which our societies collectively have tended to dominate the world. 75% of global GDP was represented by the United States and Europe in the height of the Cold War. We're down to 50%. That will soon be 40%. And we cannot afford to be inwardly focused. We cannot afford not to look out at the rest of the world. Uh, 
Whether we are able to, to kind of do that, I don't know. Uh, but I think we are living through a, a decade in which the world is changing in a way that hasn't, it hasn't changed in 200 years, in which there is really a, a, a kind of somersault taking place in the global distribution of power. And I think Americans and Europeans, despite their internal preoccupations, need to see that that's happening and to work very closely together to manage that transition. We know from history that these kinds of historical periods are dangerous, and we can't afford to be so internally preoccupied that we miss that challenge. Very good, very good. I, I wanted to emphasize one thing that, that Charles mentioned at, at the beginning, because I think sometimes we, it, get, it gets missed. It is this issue of stickiness, because it, it, is, it is one of those things that, that almost every administration does come in and decide this is a relationship that doesn't need tending and feeding to. Uh, but then when crisis hits, be it Libya, be it Syria, be it Iran, who do you turn to when you need your allies, not just on capability and war fighting, but common values? And, and I think both sides of the Atlantic sometimes forget that. Uh, and I just, I just sort of feel the need to, to emphasize that. Let me turn to the audience then. Um, let's start in the back here. Let me get out of the way so... Uh... Good morning. Uh... I don't know if this is working. Oh, and there I'm sorry. Just if everyone could just, as usual, please introduce yourself, uh, your name, and where you're from. Of uh, course. Before you, uh... Uh, David Johns, a director of a, a, a nonprofit based in the United States, Impact, as well as a Transatlantic Inclusion Leaders Network. Um, I just want to push on the last point that you offered um, and ask: How do you navigate or negotiate those politics? Sort of acknowledging that there are internal forces that shape and inform the conversations that we have across the Atlantic, but also looking outward at the same time. What does that look like? Um, how is that possible in a way that's more progressive and allows us to have productive conversations? Let me, let me group a couple of these here before I turn back to the panel. Do I have anyone else back here? Let's start with this gentleman right here in the center. If I can get a microphone. Uh, I think he's coming to your left there. Yes, Ilter Turan from Istanbul Bilgi University. I have two questions. The first one, the panel is entitled, What Does Europe Want? from the United States. If you ask the question, what does Germany want from the United States, France want from the United States, and Britain want from the United States, would the answers be similar or would there be differences between the answers? Uh, the second question I have is, uh, related to what uh, Minister Pavrix has said, uh, it is known that the Russian Federation has announced an immense military modernization program. Does that have any implication for the security of Europe? And, and last one from this round, let me start the gentleman right here in front of me, if we can get him a microphone. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, Antoine Ripoll, I'm the director of the European Parliament's office in DC. Um, I have two questions. Uh, first, I would like to wonder whether Americans realize that Europe is changing a business model. Uh, we are surely but, uh, uh, slowly but surely coming from a Europe where capitals are the essential part of, of, of the uh, business model. And now we are shifting to a core decision model between the European Parliament and the Council. So has American understood that we're changing Europe? Europe is changing. Second question is, have, uh, do Europeans really want to change the, their narrative from uh, we are, we are, you know, we made a big success with 60 years of peace. Uh, is this enough? Do we want to build together a new narrative or are we just happy with having built what we have built? Uh, so do Americans believe that they will have a new partner that is sure of itself or will continue to be uh, full of doubts and, uh, and, 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 and angst, if I may say so? Let me, let me start with uh, the minister as the current office holder to deal with, with the, f the first round of questions in particular. Uh, this issue that, that Charles raised of domestic politics in our first question, how do you navigate that? Do you, do you uh, if your population is very concerned about domestic politics, economic policy, is it possible to navigate that in, to ensure that there is support for some of these more international initiatives that, that, that uh, are needed, uh, particularly you meant the, the investment needed in, uh, in defense spending? Well, it is obviously very difficult in every country uh, 
because in every country uh, politicians depend directly on the votes and no matter how good intentions you would have if you would not have a popular support you would have no chance to implement any kind of intentions so obviously there is a room for populism and, and what we observe unfortunately is that this populism is on the rise in every country now in the European Union now if I have to def defend the defense uh, and, and spendings uh, I, I really would like to insist that uh, security issues defense issues are really in inherent, inherent um, uh, serious part of general development and I mentioned in some previous meetings that if you're buying a car and uh, you're immediately buying also the insurance and it's not because you want to crash immediately next day once you sit at the, uh, in that car but with defense is just the same if you want to ensure all the capacity what your society has collected this small insurance one two percent is 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 just that that's what you have to pay but i probably have to answer to to uh, the question from professor from istanbul uh, uh, regarding the um, uh, militarization plans in in our neighboring country and i would like to say that uh, on the one hand me as a representative of a neighboring country of russia i sometimes feel a bit irritated that we have to speak about this issue i would rather assist maybe our mediterranean friends to speak about this necessary support to north african etc but unfortunately we are forced to be in that geopolitical position we can't be on the island which is called Iceland or somewhere else. So we are where we are. And uh, if I have to be ironic again uh, Sunday morning, uh, uh, from this uh, militarization of, on, and changes and reforms of Russian industry, probably will be at least two outcomes. Uh, the first outcome, which uh, is reflected in Europe, it's, it is a good sign for European defense industry. Because as we obviously can see, uh, this is an issue which is taken up, and I'm not speaking here about uh, Mistral. I'm speaking about some even more complicated issues which are finding its way to uh, countries outside the European Union and to countries which are not always characterized as a liberal democracies as European Union. And the second, of course, uh, if we are looking to uh, the general a comparison of, of NATO or European Union military capabilities on the one side and any respectful country around us, then of course this disbalance is in favor of NATO. But if we are splitting these things according to the regions, according to the areas, then I would say that uh, in the last five years, the disbalance around the Baltic Sea is increasingly growing, not in our favor. And then I have a question to, of course, representatives of uh, um, countries which are called to be strategic partners of European Union, why there is no belief in the peacefulness of European Union and European continent? Good question. Let me, Mr. Uh, Ambassador Vimon, let me ask you to, to address the other part of question two, which is, because you have to deal with this in the, in the Foreign Affairs Council on a regular basis, is there a different answer when you go to different countries about what they want from the United States? Because clearly, uh, as the minister pointed out, there are, there, there are real geostrategic concerns about Russia in, in part of Europe, uh, there are not in other parts of Europe. Is that a difficulty when the U.S. comes up uh, in, within, the, in, within the EU, within the Foreign Affairs Council, when all 27 ministers are, are discussing foreign policy? I think, I think it depends at the level at which you're, 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 the level you're talking about. And, and I would say, if you look at it from a, a general point of view, there is some pretty strong unity among member states on the fact that they would like to have um, America more in the lead, knowing where it is going. Think of once again about the Middle East peace process, think about Syria, um, uh, think about some of these issues related to the Arab Spring. Uh, um, so there I think you, you will get uh, pretty much um, a unified position that uh, we would like um, a more assertive um, American administration knowing exactly where it wants to go. Once again, coming back to what I was saying previously, uh, Washington could um, talk back and say, um, do you know yourself what you want to do and why don't you try to come up also with uh, uh, some, some contribution? When you get into the whole issue about uh, European defense and um, the way we organize ourselves, um, uh, then, of course, you find um, the usual uh, differences that may exist. 
but I wouldn't make too much out of this. I mean, that's, the, that's always been the way Europe has been, has been working, moving ahead. I mean, those who say that's terrible, you have different views, that's the way we have been working since the 1950s. You know, we started with uh, France trying to promote its agriculture and Germany <coughs> trying to promote its industry. And it was a compromise. We live with compromise time and again in this place. And that's the way we move forward. That's, that's the whole in, in engine of, of Europe, is that we build on differences and we try to move ahead. And I think, last point, I think one has to understand that this common foreign policy we're building, it's not about um, the, um, the, the high representative and the EES moving on their own. It's, it's a system where you bring together uh, 27 member states with their own diplomatic action, something that we're trying to build at the level of Europe, and bringing this together to make it um, an added value in terms of uh, pushing Europe around the world. If you don't understand that this system is a complementary system bringing the two pieces together, um, then you, one misses something. And I think this is what it's all about at the moment. Let me ask you also to address the question of the co-decision model. For those of you who are from outside the Brussels Ring Road, uh, what, what has happened since the, the latest uh, EU treaty, the Treaty of Lisbon, the European Parliament has been given far more powers uh, to make decisions with the member states. Now, obviously, in foreign defense policy, not necessarily all that powerful, but we did see certainly on issues of, of the swift data protection where, the, where, where Joe Biden had to actually show up at the European Parliament and start lobbying individual MEPs on these issues. The Parliament has become, much like the US Congress, a, a player in some of these transatlantic issues. Do you get a sense that the US has been good about this? I mean, Kennard, obviously, the ambassador here to you, is up uh, at, at the European Parliament quite a bit. Uh, what, what is your sense in terms of the U.S. as an external actor and, and understanding how the EU works? Well, uh, I have some experience about that. I know quite well the story because uh, I've been uh, working very hard in my capacity of Vice President of European Commission in charge of Home Affairs to negotiate with the United States passenger name agreement, the famous one to prevent terrorist activities, or the so-called shift agreement on countering financial activities of terrorist group. And the parliament did not agree with the proposal we had negotiated. And they decided that there was not a right balance between security and data protection. Our American friends were a bit frustrated about that. I was able to explain that first, Europe will never become a super state, but if we are stronger, this is also because uh, there is more political and democratic legitimation coming from the European Parliament. Not only I accepted this final decision of the Parliament, but through renegotiating some paragraphs of such agreement, we came up with a better final proposal that America ac accepted at the end of the day. So the fact that we have a stronger democratic institutions is an added value, not a problem. That should be understood from the United States. In the same time, we have to avoid to be paralyzed in very long confrontation between the Council, the European Commission, you know, the, the, the famous triangle of institution co-negotiating for some time, too long time. So if we are able to uh, find the right balance between being effective and representing the democratic aspirations of so many members in the parliament, we would be stronger, not weaker, in negotiating. And our result, our final result, would be and will be more producing in the interest of transatlantic security. This is in the case of all the agreements concerning security. And the same applies to the principle of spend or cutting in public spending for defense. <laughs> If we don't coordinate, if we don't consult, if we go ahead with unilateral national decision to cut budget, there we are weaker. On the contrary, perhaps within the NATO structure, 
we will start to better coordinate and optimize, the result would be much better. Charles, let me ask you to address the final question because it's the most theoretical and as the academic, this idea of a, do we need a new narrative? I mean, this has sort of been the discussion we've had ever since the end of the Cold War. I mean, obviously the, the old joke about NATO, you know, the purpose of NATO is keep the Americans in, the Russians out and the Germans down. I mean, that isn't really relevant anymore. I think some, to some extent we've been struggling with finding a new narrative. Do we need a new narrative? Is the old narrative okay? Uh, can you just maybe address that last sure. one before I come back to the audience here? Sure. <laughs> yeah, I think we do need a new narrative and it's got several components to it. I think one of them is that uh, our societies, American society, European societies, I think confront a, a middle class crisis in which uh, the average American worker, the average European worker, maybe with the exception of some countries like Germany, have faced declining real wages and increasing inequality for quite some time. And if we're going to get our societies back in a more solvent way politically, I think we need to figure out how to solve this problem, how to get growth on both sides of the Atlantic that, uh, that is shared, broad prosperity. Uh, we don't know the answer to that question yet. I think it's partly a function of, of globalization and uh, its effect upon manufacturing, but this seems to me to be key. Get our societies back in an optimistic sense, then they will be more focused on the rest of the world. Second, I think, focus more on the connections between foreign policy and wealth, free trade, right? We face societies in which because of globalization and immigration, populist and nationalist narratives are everywhere. And we need to make sure that our societies remain open despite those increasing forces. I think the free trade conversation between the US and Europe, between the US and the Pacific region is, uh, is a good antidote to that. And then finally, I think on, on both sides of the Atlantic, there is a, a, a political discourse out there that politicians need to embrace, but thus far I think they are afraid to do so. Uh, on this side of the Atlantic, I think it is about Europe's place in the world. It's, it's, you can no longer ground the European Union in the past, in World War II, and we need this to escape war. It's got to be about the future and the projection of, Amer of European values and European power in the external world. On my side uh, of the Atlantic, we are still in a narrative about American exceptionalism, about this is an American century. You heard it from Romney. You heard it from Obama. That's not where the American public is. The American public has actually understands the world is changing, but American politicians are afraid to go out and say, hey, guess what? The world is changing. This may not be an American century. And I think it, it behooves Obama uh, and other leaders to update their discourse to the realities of the world. Uh, I don't think that they will be bitten if they do that, but we're not yet in an American political scene where they are ready to do so. Interesting. Our voters perhaps are ahead of us on, uh, on, on, on the issue in particular. Let's start to, right on this side of the room, Let's, right, right here. Hello, my name is Misha Thompson. I'm actually with the U.S. Helsinki Commission. And some of the meetings we've actually had are, um, in the United States are with a number of European youth as well as uh, people that represent diverse communities, Roma, migrants, et cetera. And one of the requests that we often have are um, how they can actually ha have exchanges, how they can um, actually participate in our universities, but also about small businesses. Um, we've had several delegations actually asked to visit our Small Business Administration, uh, Minority Business Development Association, um, Equal Opportunities Commission, and those types of things. And so I think there's some other kind of uh, economic and uh, maybe civil and human rights uh, uh, U.S. entities that are also of interest to uh, Europe, at least from some of the, the things that we've uh, been asked. Okay, <clears throat> let's pass it right over here. Gentleman right to my left. Yes, Kerry McNamara from the OCP Group. Um, you know, for a long time in the United States and in Europe to some extent, there's been this debate about the relative balance of uh, concern for defense and development in assuring a more stable world. And certainly in the 20th century, that's going to be even more important. I think in the United States, particularly under Hillary Clinton, we saw some real consciousness of that and the importance of linking them. But certainly when even one looks at the events in North Africa in the last couple of years and the role of 
poverty and lack of opportunity and even food insecurity in the region in generating conflict, it's going to be ever more important to think about how you balance uh, attention to poverty reduction and development and attention to defense and security in assuring what they are both uh, designed to do, which is to create a more stable and secure world. How does America and the United States, how can America and the United States cooperate more effectively on that front? We see a lot of summits on the issue, on food security and other issues, but what are the mechanisms for more effective cooperation between the U.S. and the United States on the development side of the picture? Okay, tough one. Then let me, for the last one in this round right here, this one. Zania Dormandy, Chatham House. I want to actually pick up kind of a little bit on your point and the stickiness idea. Uh, the other side of the stickiness, yes, are we sticky? Um, what worries me is we actually take one another for granted. There's a real sense that Europe looks at the US and says, well, they'll be there. And the US looks at Europe and says, well, yeah, you know, they complain and they're a little bit wishy-washy and maybe they don't spend enough on defense, but they'll be there when we need them. And if you combine that idea, this idea that we actually take one another for granted, with the other side of it, which is our expectations for one another are getting higher and higher, this idea that, yes, we need to spend on development, so actually, you know what, we can spend a little bit less on defense because America will cover defense and then we can cover our populations, we can cover the you know, social contract, et cetera, et cetera. We could get ourselves into a very nasty place where the expectations are quite high. We take one another for granted and assume the other will step up. And in the end, we find ourselves without the capabilities to step up and we're not, and suddenly there's a vacuum, and we're not able to do what needs to be done. And so I get the stickiness. What worries me is there isn't enough behind the stickiness to actually act. Charles, that seemed to be directed at, at your opening remarks. You wanna, do you wanna address that, uh, that, that last point in, in, to start the, uh, the panel? Uh, yeah, it's a tough question. I mean, I think that, uh, you know, we, ha we need to find the right balance between uh, doing too much and coming home empty-handed and then blaming one another uh, and doing too little and uh, finding that things start to unravel around us. Uh, and I think we've been in the doing too much mode that, at least from the American side of the house, there is a strategic weariness there is a sense that the United States, in trying to turn Iraq and Afghanistan into Ohio, uh, was crossing a bridge too far. Uh, and, and I think now the challenge is to modulate, as I said at the beginning, to find that middle road between doing too much and doing too little without actually turning inward. And I think the question about development is, is an important one in the sense that I, I think that you know, the United States is not going to be picking any fights. We see that from Libya. We see it from Mali. We see it in Syria. Uh, when I look at, at, at Obama's second term, I see one conflict looming on the horizon, and that is with Iran. And I think in the rest of the world, the U.S. is going to keep its powder dry. Uh, and, and, I, you know, th and I therefore wonder, well, who's, who's going to be delivering the goods for other crises? And my answer right now is nobody. Right? that we are going to be living in a world in which there will be an under-provision of global public goods. And that's because the United States has been the provider of last resort since 1941. That era is over. Uh, and, uh, and I think we're just gonna, get, have, to gonna get, ha uh, have to get used to a world in which there are problems out there and nobody sends out the fire trucks, lower our expectations. Because if we don't lower our expectations, you guys are going to say, where are the Americans? Americans are going to say, don't look to us. This is your backyard. And then that stickiness starts to come apart. So I would say it's time for a dose of sober realism when it comes to 
these, this global, uh, global public goods delivery. It might be too sober for a Sunday morning. I, the, the minister <laughs> was, was flagging me down because obviously this gets to your opening remarks too on, on the, the need for defense investment. But do you want to address that or did you? Just, uh, just very briefly, <clears throat> in the 90s, we have been uh, very famous in academic world and also in political world to speak about, about the uh, European soft power or EU soft power and NATO hard power, European soft power, NATO uh, United States hard power. I think that paradox or problem today is that uh, uh, do we like it or not to admit that the United States' presence in the long term in the Europe will slowly to become smaller? That's one problem. The second problem is if we ask ourselves, European Union, what can we offer to the rest of the world? Then we have nothing to offer as far as the hard power. And we have even uh, decreasing possibilities also to offer the soft influence and soft power. So actually, we have a huge disbalance between our possibilities of hard power and soft power and decreasing abilities for soft power. So actually, we are becoming less and less influential. And I think this is the hugest problem uh, uh, also in our relationship between the EU and, and, and the United States. Ambassador Beaver, let me ask you to, to, to address that issue too. Um, but I, the, I don't want to forget our first questioner who talked about the, the, the links. And I, maybe I call on a bit your, your previous job in, in Washington, because obviously, as, as a European based in Washington, part of your, your role was linking uh, SMEs, linking non traditional dip, high diplomatic actors across the ocean. Are there things we can do better uh, to make sure that, that, that minority communities or small businessmen or, or other less traditional actors? are connected better across the ocean. And also, if you could address the soft power issue as well. Yeah. Maybe <coughs> let's, let's go back to facts also. Uh, we may have problems today because of our financial crisis, but we're still the first donor around the world, uh, the EU as such. So uh, in terms of financial flow to uh, developing countries, we're still very much there. Um, and uh, even if um, the... Um, uh, budgetary discussions at the moment between the 27 are difficult ones, uh, we will still remain a, a, a major donor as, as we go along. So the idea that we don't have any more soft power or even uh, hard power, I'm not so sure about it. Think about Mali at the moment. Of course, the French came in first and they were very impressive in the way they um, uh, went ahead. But who's coming just behind and doing a lot of the work at the moment in Mali? It's Europe. Um, it's, it's the European with the training and the restructuring of the uh, armed force uh, in Mali. And this is, for me, is not soft power. It's more interesting than that. It's about security sector reform and many things of that sort. Who's uh, providing assistance to the African force? 50 million euros. It's the Europeans. Who's bringing in the development assistance? Short term and long term. 250 million in the long term. 20 million right now on the ground in the liberated zone. Who's pushing the political process at the moment in, in Mali? Trying to bring an election by, the, by, by July. The Europeans. And we're very much looked at in Mali as the main partner at the moment. So I think let's not underestimate uh, ourselves. Second thing about stickiness, and what I, I very much agree with what Charles is saying, is that we need to um, wake up to the reality of today. But precisely the reality of today, which means that if we do no, nothing in a few years' time, uh, apart from we won't be any more uh, for 50% of the global wealth in the world, but something like one-third, population increase. So we are um, one-sixth or one-seventh of the population in a few years' time. It would be one-tenth only or something like that. If we don't look at the trends as they are going on and we don't try to counteract, of course we will slowly altogether become a, a small part of a world that is changing very quickly. So one of the reasons why we have to stick together is that if we only want to protect our interest, whether it be huge cooperation or small and medium-sized cooperation, we better work together quickly, try to push forward our own interests, our own values, um, and our own interests. And I think this is very much what the free trade agreement is all about. By the way, this is the way the others, looking at what we're trying to do, are looking at us exactly in that way. Uh, and they're somewhat worried and concerned about the possible success of that free trade agreement and what it will mean in terms of new standards being pushed ahead, which will be US and, and European standards. So we still have a force that on which we have and a strength on which we have to build on. 
Mr. Rattini, let me ask you to address that same point and also just to make sure we address this issue of, I mean, again, as someone who has experienced both here at the ultimate soft power, the EU, but also the more hard power end of things in, in, in Italy, um, how do we balance, strike the balance to on development, but also uh, making sure we keep the, the hard end of the, of the, of the spear? Yeah. <clears throat> this is a very key point. Uh, I believe that this is exactly why we have to develop what we used to call a comprehensive approach to global security, not limited to uh, purely military means, but considering all what would have an impact on our security, lack of development, mass migration, poverty, desertification, all these are crucial component to be understood and to be addressed together. And this is another ground of excellent cooperation for America and European Union. Why? Because uh, think about, for example, to the need of elaborating together a common global strategy on mass migration or what to do with the stalemate on the door around the negotiations. I want to recall a, a, a phrase that touched me during a G8 Italian presidency in 2009. One of the most important leaders of Africa raised the hand in a formal session and he said, dear Western friends, President Obama was there, either you take our goods or you take our people. You cannot do anything. This is a key to explain why our security will depend on addressing the roots leading to desperation, leading militias to be established because of, I would say, think about a, a last example I want to make. If only we would be able to reduce by half the rate of interest that has to be paid for the remittances of migrants, we would increase by the equal amount that uh, every year is the sum of aid for development in the world. But only by reducing by half, they pay on the average 10% or remittances on migrants, banks, money transfer. Shouldn't be we all engaged, we and Americans, to push over this money transfer, the banks, to cut this remittances cost. This would be increasing to the destination, to the final destination countries, huge amount of money to address poverty. These are two examples where America and you should be very strongly engaged because this is security. These are the preconditions to pave the way to prevent rather than just reacting to Sahel, to Africa, and so on. It's a good thing Western Union is not a sponsor of, of, of this event. Um, let, me, let me just, we're, we're about to, to wrap up here. I, I, before I get back to the side, I promise the gentleman in the front row right there, why don't you, we start with you there. I'm a pro professor from Beijing on international politics, and uh, first I will very shortly to express my observation of this relationship between old husband the United States and, uh, and uh, an old wife Europe. And then I will raise my question in terms of very simple concept of values, values and power. And uh, from my from Asian perspective, we found that the, almost the increasing alienation and of the United States from Europe in fundamental disposition, for example. And we found uh, European enthusiasm in, you know, most recently years and months about the intervention, especially in France, and uh, in, in some degree in Great Britain. But the United States have a well-known and very clear Obama doctrine, which I think that our professor uh, explored very clearly. And, uh, and also in example, and uh, Americans are still part some emphasis on military of a nation, and just as almost China began to do. And, but the European, I think, uh, 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 living in a postmodern world where there is no armed forces, no possibility of war, and so on. Also, I think that the United States 
is increasingly realized. This world is really changed. So the United States not only and keep an old special relationship with Europe, but also launch a new special relationship in Asia, with Asia, not only with you know, all the allied Japan, but also with China. And so th this is uh, our Asian perspective to find the situation. My question is that the, in terms of value, I think that the Europeans are very self-confident. And generally, Europeans don't think that the, the, they, they, they require any other outsider, including United States, to provide their, their, their value. Maybe and right, but uh, in our in my perspective, a little, somewhat a little, you know, self righteously And Europeans want United States power. And uh, what does European want from United States? Power, financial power, and of course, defense power. But I, my question is to, to American professor, and uh, in your perspective, and what kind of value United States is still and, uh, able to provide to Europe? At plant and in future. No Thank power. You. Power, American supply of power to Europe is uh, taken for granted by Europeans, but, but value. Thank you, sir. Let me, uh, the gentleman right here. For <coughs> yes, um, uh, Gian Giacomo Migone, uh, University of Torino. There's a brief point I want to make concerning defense expenditure. As a matter of fact, if you sum what European countries spend on the fence. It's a hell of a lot of money. It's almost a half of the what the US spend. But the efficacy is about 10 to 15 percent. So what the Americans should ask us for is to get our act together. Because we're duplicating in, in a useless manner what each country spends. So instead of whining about burden sharing in the old sense, the American request should be unify your expense, even if that, you know, means that there's always a price to pay, you know, that we will have to also unify in a strategic way what we produce in terms, in military terms, so it'll be harder for the Americans to push F-35s down our throat, especially if we read the New York Times that tells us that it's, it's not working very well. Obviously, it was tried with BAE and EADS, the merger that failed largely because of the German Chancellor. Let me uh, finish right here, and then I'll turn back to the panel. I might just go right to left and, and have your thoughts for closing remarks as well. Madam, do we have the microphone for here? <coughs> Hello, my name is Federica Vindi. I'm a senior fellow at SAIS, John Hopkins in Washington and professor in Rome. I wanted to go back to a comment which were made. Charlie, you called for more realism. I would say we should call for more mutual understanding. My feeling is that while in the US we don't understand how difficult it is to come to decisions in Europe, in Europe Likewise, people don't understand how difficult it is sometimes to take decisions in the U.S., the role of the Congress, how the decision-making uh, process is affected, even international relations. And, uh, and frankly, you call for a united Europe. And I, I, well, you said that a united Europe is important for the U.S., and I share this view, um, especially as, as the, go, the times goes by. So if you look at European history, there is, in fact, a correlation between the Farther, farther integration and support from the US. The first Obama administration uh, had a few steps for, you know, for dialoguing, uh, Mr. Monsieur Vimont, vous êtes vous, uh, you were there, for dialoguing with, with the EU as a multilateral entity. And then it back, it back down to bilateral relations again. So I think there should be ways, and there are ways for the US to push for a united EU voice. You know, less bilateral relation, more multilateral. I think the U.S. can do a lot to force the Europeans to speak with one single voice, and that we could be very useful. So I would like to hear your opinions on that. All right, a couple of these questions were, were aimed right at you, Charles. So why don't I ask you to address both of them, and then maybe even some, in some closing comments that you have. Uh, the question specifically about values. Is, is, is the only thing Europe wants from the U.S. its hard power, its money? Does the U.S. have something to offer Europe in terms of values? And then also this issue of whether the U.S. has a role in help forging 
a common uh, European uh, vision. Frankly, I think in the past it has been something the U.S. has wanted, the whole famous Kissinger, you know, you pick up the phone, you can't call Europe. Uh, but can you address those? And also, if you have any closing remarks that you'd like to address also, why don't you go ahead, Charles? Sure. Um, to your question, Frederica, I, I think that uh, you're right to say that we need to be uh, sensitive to the difficulties that we face on, on, on both sides of the Atlantic and acknowledge that these are tough times. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, I, I don't think that the tough times are soon to come to an end. Uh, I, I'm someone who believes the United States is remarkably resilient. I don't think our best days are behind us. I think the American economy will snap back. I don't know when or how. And I don't know any American who can really tell you how we are going to get out of this, the pickle that we are in right now where um, Republicans and Democrats live so far apart from each other ideologically that it's difficult to govern. Uh, I think we'll, we'll get past that. I don't know when, and as I said, I, 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 I don't know of anyone who has said how we're gonna do it. Because you've got multiple layers from you know, economic inequality, the congressional redistricting problem, campaign finance, the re-regionalization of American politics. You solve one of them, you've still got five left. Uh, but uh, as I said, I'm, I'm confident, but uh, I wish I had a better sense of how and when this will happen. I'm a little bit more skeptical than you that the United States can really make a difference here. Well, you know, okay, so we'll call Brussels instead of Berlin, but we won't get an answer. Uh, pardon by, by saying that, but, but we're, we're increasingly getting uh, an answer, but it's really up to you, right? It's up to you to get to the point where little by little you, you get more and more power to the EAS and to other institutions and then we will follow. But, but I think it's, it's putting the cart before the horse to think the United States can make that happen. To, to your question, uh, Professor Scher, you know, I think that there really is something unique and exclusive to the American-European relationship. I think it is founded upon a common civilization, a common history, a set of common values and common interests that are not replicated elsewhere in the world. Uh, and in, in contrast to many Americans who believe that domestic regime type is a good predictor of geopolitical alignment, I don't believe that. When I look out at the world and look at Brazil, India, Turkey, and other emerging democracies, I do not think that they will align themselves with the US and Europe as a matter of course. Sometimes they will align themselves with China, sometimes with us, but that this kind of Western world really is going to remain a kind of anchor of democratic liberal values for the foreseeable future. And I think with China, with Egypt, with other parts of the world, we're gonna to have to create new cooperative relationships. We're gonna have to find a way to build institutions of global governance that are not just predicated on our rules. And I still think Washington believes that the system that we have collectively built is about to be universalized. Don't bet on it. I think our system will remain our system, but we will have to live in a world, a more diverse and pluralistic world, in which different kinds of, of systems live cooperatively alongside each other. It's a more difficult world, but I think it's the one that we will see evolve over the course of this century. Charles, you're far too sobering for the Sunday morning. <laughs> Mr. Fertini, if I can ask, uh, it'd be a little bit cheeky to ask you to answer the question on, on, on uh, military spending, a country that I believe is F-16, also part of F-35, also part of Eurofighter, also flies Tornado, uh, not particularly effective use necessarily of, of, of defense spending. Is that a possibility of a common defense expenditure in Europe? This is, is, is talk about sovereignty. This gets to the core. Is that a realistic thing? I think everyone agrees it needs to be done, but is it a realistic outcome given the sensitivity of defense spending? Uh, but also any closing remarks you might have uh, to wrap us up. <clears throat> yes, uh, th thank you very much. I, I thank Professor Migone for the question because it is a really important indeed. We have been talking for a very long time in Europe about having a two European defense strategy. Defense strategy should include, to me, uh, a system of better consultation and coordination 
among the member states of, U of Europe to optimize spending on defense rather, just, rather than just cutting spending horizontally. I make an example uh, again. Uh, as, as you know uh, perfectly, uh, in a very important mission of NATO to Afghanistan, we found to have at our disposal huge number of warplanes that in Afghanistan were, yes, important but not so necessary, while missing a number of helicopters that were extremely important to land in the areas <coughs> or in the regions outside Kabul in Afghanistan. So the idea of optimizing, we have a huge number of ground forces in member states, in each of us, and these ground forces are quite difficult to manage. If we want to become an alliance, I think about a NATO alliance, capable to rapidly react in case of need and optimizing the use of modern capability. Think about uh, facing the cyber crime uh, threat. So this would mean having a political decision. It comes to a political decision. It's not a technical decision to be taken by bureaucrats. They know perfectly where to cut. It's very easy. Easy to cut horizontally by 1.5% each and every year. It's much more difficult to take a political decision after a previous consultation among equals. This is another challenge for us, for our American friends, for Europeans. We know what to do. We have to strengthen our European integration. More European economic integration as well as political integration. And political integration includes foreign policy and defense policy while our American friends will have to agree with us that given our common values and common goals, there will be, uh, I would say, agreeing with us the idea of consultation within the forum we have, our alliance, our historical alliance, our transatlantic alliance, where is possible to draw a conclusion and to have a division of labor which is not affecting these or that individual member states, but this is to the benefit of the whole alliance. I hate to cut you off, I just got the hook here. Let me ask the last two panelists to, to take a, 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 just wrap up quick in thought so we can get the, the minister to his, his plane. Uh, Ambassador Vimont, just a, a quick 60 seconds if I could, just maybe perhaps wrapping us up, uh, your final thoughts. Very, very quickly, just three points. Uh, first one, very much along the lines of what was saying Charles, but, uh, um, let's put it in the defense sector. If people think that what we're trying to do is, is to rebuild a sort of a NATO of our own in, in, inside Europe, of course this is not what we're trying to do. We're trying to find something different, otherwise it would be sheer duplication and that would be a nonsense. And this is why it's complicated sometimes to find out the proper way to move ahead. There's need for a, a strong political will, we all know that, um, and, uh, but, but we're moving on. And it's it seems to me that what we have found and what we have did in Libya, in Mali, what we're trying to do today in Syria also, is an interesting new way of, uh, as I was saying previously, division of labor. And I, and I think that's rather interesting and something on which we should build. The second idea that Europe is um, somewhere out there not knowing what to do strikes me very much at, at not very being very much in line with reality. Just one example, which I find quite striking, the whole question about Syrian sanctions and how to support the opposition. Nobody noticed very much then when, when John Kerry was in, was in Rome and um, uh, released his package of uh, technical assistance, lethal equipment, he was doing exactly what the Europeans had done three weeks before. After a difficult debate, but which was a major breakthrough and a very interesting one, which means that sometimes we can come up with good ideas also and, and show the way. And in fact, as we are discussing today with, with our American colleagues on, on Syria, uh, they're the ones who are telling us quite often, um, if you have good ideas, come and bring it to us. So I think it's uh, becoming more of a two-way street, more than we imagine sometimes.
I'll stop on here. Iran as well, in some cases, uh, Europe led the way on the sanctions regime before the U.S. Congress could. Let me ask you, since it's your, your plane that you have to catch, why don't you wrap uh, us up uh, in, in any, any grand thoughts to, to leave us with uh, on the just, way out? Just to our left, one particular and one general. Um, as far as the defense of Europe uh, or defense sector, uh, I think the only uh, outcome at this moment also of in the moment of austerity, is uh, basically to increase capabilities through transnational cooperation. And that requires a common funding, but most of all, it requires a leadership in Europe. That's very important. Uh, as far as the general issue with what we started, what do we want from US and what do we want from ourselves, uh, I think that our, uh, um, let's say, family is still living in a situation uh, where uh, sorry for using the concrete names where Obama is hunting and Van Rumpo is uh, cooking. And I would rather offer for this uh, 1950s family construction something more different, maybe a Nordic family where both can cook and both can hunt. <laughs> thank you. Very good. And on that note, thank you very much. It's been a very lively discussion for an early Sunday morning and I hope you have a good day today. <laughs> thank Minister Pabricks, we didn't want to detain you, so I'm glad you're off. You're not going to miss your plane. That's important. Uh